Welcome to the Bacaro Community Green, an open space for thought leaders to discuss the ongoing challenges in gas, energy, and beyond. I'm Tracy Boyd, Marketing Director for Bacaro, and the episode you're about to hear is part of our series covering methane data collection, leak detection, and emissions measurement. Today's discussion focuses on Picaro's Emissions 360, a comprehensive approach to emissions measurement and reduction. We're privileged to have Jacob Kanzler and Sean McMillan from Picaro join us to share their expertise in this vital field. Congratulations on winning the One Future Technology of the Year Award. What was the initial inspiration or problem that you two set out to solve? Yeah, I think it really goes back to probably two years before then. Uh, Sean and Francois actually wrote a, uh, a paper on, on leak size bias removal that uh, actually won the 2022 Research and Development Award for One Future. Uh, so the, the big story there is we were able to kind of take that research uh, and turn that into a product. Uh, it was something that, that people cared about, something the industry needed. Uh, we were able to productize that solution uh, to be able to build Emissions 360 uh, and, and in turn, obviously won the One Future Award. Uh, but the, the inspiration is really, the, the industry needed a tool to understand their emissions on their distribution network. You know, when, uh, when we go out and we make measurements with, with Bacara, we measure the flow rate of, uh, of each source. Um, and the challenge then is how do you take that flow rate that you measure and then turn it into an emissions inventory? So you have to take the, the sum of the driving that you've done, integrate that over the year. Um, and it turns out that when you uh, make these measurements that have an uncertainty associated with them uh, and you combine that with this highly skewed leak size distribution, so you have very few leaks uh, at the top that are, are large and contribute to, to most of the emissions. And then most of the leaks are small and don't contribute to the emissions. Um, once you combine these two sources of uncertainty, uh, you actually lead to a bias in which you over you tend to overestimate the, uh, the total emissions on the network. Oh, um, and so we developed a framework, uh, Francois and I developed this framework and, and published it that uh, uh, describe that problem in, in more detail and then actually uh, laid out kind of the statistical framework uh, to, to remove that bias so that when you actually make your emissions measurements over uh, over a year over a geography and sum them up that uh, that you don't have uh, that you don't have an overall bias how does e360 contribute to methane emissions reduction um, and really what sets it apart from other solutions in the field or are there any other solutions in the field yeah, it's, it's, it's critical to emissions reduction. Uh, if you take a step back and you try to really understand your emissions, there's only one way to do it in today's world, and that's with traditional emission factors. Uh, multiplied emission factor at times, number of miles in your system, and that kind of gives you a starting point for what your emissions could be. Uh, we all know that's not necessarily the most accurate or confident way to do it. So what Emissions 360 and the research that Sean did enables you to do is actually truly understand your emissions. Uh, there's really only one way that emissions reduction works, and that's if you know what your actual measurement informed inventory is. Uh, so Emissions 360 actually enables operators to uh, measure their emissions uh, and understand what their emissions baseline is by measurement. And then that, that gives them a number that they can actually act on and go out and repair the larger leaks on their system and actually actively reduce emissions. Uh, and then Emissions 360 also uh, offers a super meter program planner tool uh, that was developed uh, by Francois. And uh, it also gives you the ability, if you have a, a net zero goal of 2030 or 2040 or 2050, the ability to plan a, a operational strategy in order to show you how to get there. And it'll actually be able to simulate your, your network and show you what your uh, proposed emissions reduction over time will be and help you set those supermeter thresholds. It's all about starting with a baseline, starting with a measurement and creating these measurement informed inventories so that an operator can start to understand, you know, truly where their emissions stand um, relative to different asset classes uh, that they that they have to report on uh, relative to, you know, current reporting frameworks uh, uh, that usually use emission factors like your EPA subpart uh, W reporting. So. Um, so that's really the first, the first aspect of it. Um, and then the second piece of it that's really critically important is the understanding of the overall uncertainty on the, um, on the emissions inventory that you get. So 
For example, with uh, the classic emission factor uh, based inventories, uh, you're limited very much by your, your sampling. Uh, the number of data points that goes into these measurements is, is small. And so therefore the uncertainty on the measurements uh, are, are very large. And so even if you report uh, a number at the end, you don't really know uh, where your emissions truly stand. Mm -hmm. um, so um, measurement informed inventories really start to change the game, um, especially using uh, Bacaro technology that we can actually leverage the scale of the network. Um, as you measure more and more, um, even if you have a you know, relatively poor precision on an individual source at the scale of the network, you actually decrease your uncertainty and have very good precision, uh, usually on the order of about 10%. So you can start to understand really you know, where you stand truly in your terms of your emissions um, at the network scale. Um, and then I think Jacob mentioned it uh, uh, earlier as well, but uh, uh, the really enabler here this opens up is the opportunity to act. So um, to drive emissions down by being able to discriminate these very large leaks from very small leaks and being able to, to, to make meaningful abatement efforts um, uh, based on the prioritization of, of the largest leaks in, in the network. So none of this is possible without, without direct measurements and uh, Emissions 360 and the tools we provided start to unlock all the, those different tools for the operator. Did both of you or individually, did you guys, was your intention to go into the climate tech business? Was that something that really drew you? Because you both seem really passionate and about what you do, or you're good liars, I'm not sure. Um, you know, you both, is that something that, that, that drew you to the business, was working with a company like Picaro? Why don't you start with that, Jacob? Yeah, so I uh, actually started my career in the air quality business. For anybody that knows what con uh, continuous emissions monitoring or stack testing, uh, I actually started as a, uh, as, as a stack testing or field technician on air quality measurements. Um, it was it was a lot of fun it was, it, and uh, really gave a passion and understanding and a lot of experience really fast in the air quality business, uh, which in turn led to, uh, I actually worked in the contracted for the Office of Research and Development for the EPA uh, for quite some time. Okay. Uh, so I got a lot of uh, opportunities to work with uh, advanced technologies, uh, next generation air quality monitors, they would say. Uh, so I had a, quite a bit of experience to actually use Picaro instruments before I, before I actually came to Picaro. Oh, okay. But I did, I did take a, uh, I pride myself in being kind of an air quality nerd or enthusiast. I did take a break. <laughs> Who knew that existed? Okay. I did, I did take a break for about a year, and then I uh, I decided to come back to it because I still found myself researching uh, air quality sensors for fun. So here I am. Yeah, for, for me, it was, uh, I would say, a little bit less intentional. I started uh, my career really in, in ac the academic side. I was doing uh, uh, nuclear and particle physics, um, but really the the statistical application, you know, while, while I was working in that field, um, applies really well into, into other fields. And so I came with the opportunity to work with this small company who was uh, trying to get into the uh, mobile uh, methane monitor space. We didn't really know how to do it at the time mm -hmm. um, and uh, had the opportunity to, um, you know, start to think about, you know, different problems and how to take the, you know, the, you know, the statistical knowledge and computational background and apply it into a different domain. And so for me, that's been, um, you know, really compelling from, from a career perspective. And, you know, so while I said it maybe wasn't the intention when I, when I came to join the company, um, you know, it's certainly a passion now, 10 years later. Yeah. And I, and I can see, um, like you said, coming from the academia where you're just, you're trying to imagine something that doesn't exist. And that's really in a lot of ways what we're doing here is we're trying to go, well, what, what do we need and how do we, or even we don't even know what we need. How do we get, make sure we're out in front of it? So in that aspect, Jacob, you know, in your opinion, what's the most innovative aspect of E360? Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest, one of the biggest problems with, with a lot of, uh, environmental campaigns or field campaigns uh, where you're managing large data sets is there's usually a big disconnect and, and what are you actually supposed to do with the data? Uh, you can get overwhelmed. Uh, if you think about the actual amount of data points that are generated, um, I think we could say as of as since 2015, we, we did the metrics where Picar alone has almost 7 billion data points. Uh, that's ex extremely overwhelming for somebody to kind of mm -hmm. comprehend on their own. And what E360 does or Emissions 360 uh, the beauty of it is it actually handles that data set for you. It takes that data stream and it twists it in a way that can be applied to an emissions inventory 
and really helps the operators or clients not have to reinvent the wheel and really apply that data to a particular use case that's valuable. Yeah, I think to to extend on on Jacob's comments there, we've had um, you know there's a number of different frameworks like uh, GTI's Project Veritas, which is uh, kind of giving the uh, protocols for doing measurement informed inventories. But I, I see there's still a lot of gap between the uh, sort of generic uh, technology agnostic Veritas protocols and then how you actually implement something for, for the operator. And so that's where I think the innovation on, on E360 has, has been a, a big benefit is to actually take that, uh, take that process and you know, build a solution around, uh, uh, around the implementation of that process with AMLD that can uh, be delivered to an operator. And then operators can uh, not need to focus on you know, hiring a group of uh, GHG experts and statisticians, but can actually leverage our technology and then really keep the focus on their operations. You spoke earlier about uh, something you called the super the super emitter tool. I think the audience would uh, just love to get a high level view of what what is that? You know, why is that such a uh, you know what can we expect from that exciting development? Yeah, it's actually a, a an industry one of a kind, uh, to my knowledge, to be able to use this type of planning tool. Uh, so for a Super emitter program planner, uh, basically is a super emitter is just defined by a, a threshold that the customer deems uh, a high emitter or a large volume leak. Uh, and the, the ability to reduce your emission is the, the key is to actually go out and fix those large volume leaks. Uh, so what it does is it actually allows you to build a accurate representation of your company. And then it har harnesses the power of that leak distribution curve that Sean alluded to earlier in this podcast. Uh, and you can actually tailor that. Uh, we, can, we can adjust that curve to match your system's curve so the emissions are more realistic for you. Okay. Uh, so it's a tailored tool in order to visualize and plan how much of the network should you drive, uh, how, much are, how much can you drive, uh, what my threshold should be in order to achieve the goals that I set out to have. Uh, we, we see a lot of times that companies have these ambitious net zero goals. And what, what this tool can do is really show you should I be more uh, aggressive in my goals? I can actually achieve a lot more. Or, hey, should I, should I actually kick it in gear if we want to make it by 2030? The emissions reduction is going to have to be pretty aggressive. And I know you did a demo on this, so I, I did get a sneak peek, but it looked like you were able to do uh, fine tune things like how many, how many drives I'm taking, how many cars I have in my fleet, how expensive are my cars, how many operators do I have, how many drivers do I have. Um, so there's a lot of inputs that they can use to tweak it, right? Yeah, so the byproduct of that is we also have a, an output of kind of an operational cost of what it's going to take to, to run a submitter program. It's not an, an actual cost. There are other ways to recover that cost in different financial models. But to just get kind of a sense of the overall cost of the program, uh, we can look at even things as far down as miles per gallon of the vehicle or gasoline cost or the, the average miles per gallon. Uh, there's a lot of fun things you can tweak the cost of the people that are running the program. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the future, the cost of the IRA methane penalty, if it were to apply to, to the distribution system. So we do have a lot of levers you can pull and play with uh, in order to manipulate the data. Yeah, I think the, um, the technologies that are being used by uh, gas operators are evolving rapidly. The capabilities are, are evolving rapidly. Um, and what's that? what that's enabling is you know, a transition to measurement where this wasn't possible 10 years ago. Now companies are able to do uh, measurements and they're able to do measurements uh, more efficiently and more quickly on their network. So that's where kind of this driverless car mm -hmm. uh, concept comes in that you can actually, um, you know, accelerate the data collection on your network. And so, um, you know, what that, you know, does enable already and will continue to do more of, I think, is um, allowing operators more real-time access to the data um, so they can monitor emissions in their network, for example, um, and start to develop programs and plans around that to reduce, reduce emissions so they can um, react more quickly to events um, of concern, but also start to be more proactive about their emissions reduction strategies and less reactive about their emissions uh, reduction strategies. Um, and I think, you know, even even a bit more forward look, looking and, and potentially beyond the 
even the oil and gas sector, but thinking more globally about uh, environmental stewardship, these technologies exist across every domain. I think we're going to start to see more, um, you know, open data platforms that uh, host data sets, uh, host best practices, um, you know, documentation that, that, you know, thought leaders uh, in the industry can can share with each other and uh, and promote, you know, um, you know, uh, ideas to to their communities and to their legislators around around emissions reduction and environmental stewardship. We've seen a lot of new technologies come up, as you said, over the last ten years, and and, and the time is now. We have the ability to we have the ability to measure everything. Uh, you mentioned driverless cars, but it, it could be a ways off. Uh, but we have the ability to measure everything, and people are really learning and adapting and scaling. Uh, and as people continue to scale, obviously the next best thing is to figure out how to reduce burden or operational procedures as people scale. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think, I think first we need, to be, we need to get on board with, with measuring and detecting and reducing emissions. And then as everybody kind of jumps on board and, and rides that wave, then we, then we can take a step back and think about, okay, how can we do this more efficiently and effectively manage our resources? Mm-hmm.